we'll get underway. So we've got Aaron Soto and Matt Bromley. They've, um, they're from Rapid7 and Sands. So if everyone could kindly welcome them with a round of applause. Right. They're going to be talking about purple packets, effective network defense against real world attacks. And we'll talk about some of it recently. Uh, so I'm really look looking forward to these one, this one, guys. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. Hopefully, everyone enjoyed their morning tea. Uh, as you can tell, I am not from Australia, so uh, that part should be pretty obvious. Uh, neither is Aaron here. Um, but uh, we're super excited to be here with everyone. Uh, you know, I'm not going to lie. Um, someone reaches out and says, hey, uh, we're having a conference at the Gold Coast. Would you like to come speak? Our answer usually is, without a doubt. Now? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. But uh, it's been an absolutely amazing few days. So thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, I'm going to do my best to stay within range of talking into the mic. We usually have a stage which is like a walking. We're, we're, we're logging miles as we walk through this one. But uh, we're going to stand next to each other and hopefully not kill each other in the process. All right. So welcome to Purple Packets. Uh, this is a really uh, a labor of passionate interest between Aaron and myself. Um, I guess traditionally you could say we've both sat in kind of red or blue roles, which means we bring really, really awesome perspectives to solving various problems. And we were like, hey, we wonder if other folks are, you know, looking at these the same way. Um, we're going to talk very, very briefly about who we are, and then we're going to get into why we're doing this. But we really want to get to the heart of the matter, which is starting to analyze traffic, starting to analyze attacker activity. And we also have a nice little surprise built up at the end of this for everyone as well. Uh, we have some pretty groundbreaking, how old now? Uh, 36 hours? About that, yeah. 36 yeah. hour old research that uh, is hopefully going to never be needed. Absolutely. Which is the worst type of research you can do, but also the best type of research. So we'll talk about that um, in any event. Sure thing. Yeah, so let's get started just very, very briefly who we are. Uh, my name is Aaron Soto. I'm an exploit developer. Uh, I've kind of, uh, if, as Matt said, we kind of uh, have, have walked the red and blue lines a little bit separately, and so I'm a little bit more traditionally towards the red side. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, there's a competition called CCDC, the Cyber Collegiate Defense Competition, working with college students to teach them how to protect themselves against hackers. Uh, there's a competition at DEF CON. Just out of curiosity, how many folks have been to DEF CON before, just to get a feel? So if, you, if, you're, if you're going this year, there's a, uh, the Blue Team Village, which Matt and I are both a uh, part of, and there's a, a Capture the Flag competition called Open Sock, where we talk about or we, we get as much hands-on experience uh, with uh, some of these attacks as possible. Um, and then also just, you know, because uh, I'm a nerd, I'm a ham radio guy. Uh, but, uh, but fundamentally, I love open source. I love uh, the exploit side of things. Awesome. And I'm Matt, obviously. Uh, I got us started off this afternoon. Uh, I am an incident responder by trade, practice, uh, free time, spare time, whatever it may be. Um, I also happen to be an instructor with SANS. I teach our advanced host forensics and advanced network forensics. Uh, if any, if I've had any of you in class, it's really bright up here. So I apologize for not re recognizing you here. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Aaron likes to play with ham radios. I like to put nerd stuff on my body. And I have uh, nerdy ink tattoos on. So that's where that's from as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about the importance of this, Absolutely. why this is crucial, why we're talking about this, if you will. Um, and we'll start out by really saying that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of focus on the way that attackers do what they do from the host perspective. Um, and that's nice because there's a lot of way an attacker can launch a piece of executable code, can escalate privileges, can establish persistence, maintain persistence, defeat different operating systems. That's all cool and great, but what we found during a lot of our research is that attackers tend to really ignore the one area where it's easiest to catch them was inside of the network protocol. Um, and what you'll see, and no offense to you know Metasploit, Aaron standing up here on stage, wow, look at this amazing thing I can craft and create. Oh, cool. How does it talk? Oh, it talks over HTTP. Really? Like you worked all this time to make this amazing thing and then sent it over a plain text protocol. Um, so we really wanted to kind of hinge off of that and take the kind of unique approach of, is there a way that we can look at the network side of things to identify traffic a lot faster than perhaps waiting for the host to be compromised or waiting for a time further on down the road? The importance of red and blue really, we think, exists in our working together. So from a blue perspective, we often think of ourselves as defenders. We're the ones that are resort responding to attacks, and we're the ones that are having to deal with these things later on down the line. And unfortunately, in my career, I've seen way too many times where the red team is just pushed off to the side as these annoying kids who pop up once a quarter. And I'm, I mean, well. I'm, well, I'm not saying they're wrong. <laughs> I'm just saying that's the, that's the wrong approach. 
as a blue teamer, you should be actively looking to learn from how red does what they do because they're going to find the novel ways into your environment. They're gonna find the things that you never thought of. Um, and to be completely frank, and I'll let Aaron talk about the red side here yeah. in a second, but to be completely frank, I would rather he find it because I'm asking him to find it as opposed to I discovered that China found it four years ago. That's the other side of the equation we don't wanna be in. Now, sure. yeah. I think he can benefit from us too. Absolutely, yeah. So it's, it's easy from a, a red teamer's perspective to say, well, this is the glamorous side, right? This is, what, this is the side that everybody's talking about. The latest exploits, the newest attacks. This is what, what is easy to sensationalize. Uh, no one in Hollywood makes a, a blue teamer a Hollywood, you know, the, the, the character of a hacker movie. Sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, for, I think, you know, I got a fantastic base for radio. <laughs> Just but, saying. But I have to admit that uh, if I want to be a good red teamer, I need to understand the tactics of the blue team. I need to understand how to challenge them by looking, by going to places that they aren't looking, by introducing techniques that they're not ready for. And so I can't just say, oh, you know, I love exploit development. I'm going to write exploits all day. I mean, I can but I'm not gonna be as good of a red teamer as I can be. And so that's what we're focusing on is we're gonna make this case that we, we can learn from each other, we do learn from each other, and uh, Matt and I are very big into giving you examples. We're not gonna stand here and talk about it, we're gonna show you how. Yeah, that's really it on the uh, discussion side. The only thing I'll add to what Aaron just said is uh, there was one thing I heard as, uh, this was probably in the past three months or so, um, there was one thing I heard that really kind of strengthened this talk for me, which was I was helping an organization respond to an incident. They had just gone under a legitimate pen test, meaning they were paying for it, it was their quarterly whatever, and the pen test report came back, and one of the active directory administrators said out loud after reading the report, thank God they didn't find system XYZ. And I'm thinking in my head like, why is that a good thing? And he's like, because that system would have made this so much easier for them. And I'm like, I would have loved for the red team to have known that because as a blue team, I mean, that was the obvious question, let's patch that vulnerability. But the other side of it is they found a way that was not the easy, and I'm not saying Aaron directly, but the red side found a way in, which was not the easiest way. That's a true test of defenses. So it keeps being solidified as we work with more and more organizations. They keep having this stance of, oh, thank God this thing didn't happen, or I can't believe how easy that was. And we don't want teams to be confounded anymore. So there we go. That's our discussion on why. Now let's talk about the what, the mm -hmm. interesting part. Absolutely. We're going to get into some examples now. We're going to have some fun. By the way, I hope you're all paying attention. <laughs> you're going to need it very, very shortly. For sure. So let's talk about a pretty textbook scenario from a red team perspective. So I'm an attacker, I'm outside a network, I want to get inside the network. Step one, the thing that's probably the easiest, most reliable, least sophisticated, I don't have to have an O-Day or anything, spear phishing attack, right? Send out some emails, if I craft them particularly well, I can get a user to click on a link, open an email, execute a payload. It'll happen eventually. It's, it's a tried and true tactic. So Who, who doesn't want a new friend on Facebook? I'm just saying, I mean, who doesn't? No. <laughs> uh, so we get, we, we get our access into the network as a red teamer. Uh, from there, obviously, the, the traditional red team perspective is I want, uh, I want domain control. I want to be a domain administrator. I want to dump credentials. I want access to everything. Obviously, there might be some steps in between, but that's, that's my goal, is to pivot inside the network, laterally move, escalate up until the point of a domain administrator. Once I get uh, either those credentials, once I get the sensitive information I'm after, I'm going to exfiltrate. Obviously, there's a lot of flourish that can happen in here, but the workflow is generally the same, right? And that's our talk. Have a great afternoon. Yeah, there you go. It, easy peasy. <laughs> so just stop there. Well, okay, so let's walk through these steps. I want to get initial access. There's a lot of tools to do this. Uh, how many folks have used like a social engineering toolkit? Any kind of these tools that generate social engineering campaigns? They're pretty common, for sure. Uh, and, and so then you know how easy this is. There, there are constantly tools being released all the time. Everybody kind of has their own techniques, their own tools. But there, there are other handful out there. For, for this, uh, just to kind of introduce something a little bit different, how many fo folks have used GoFish before? Okay, More a couple. Hands. Okay, More hands. yeah, excellent. Uh, so for those of you who haven't, GoFish is a, is a very simple web uh, web based phishing tool. So it's very easy to craft a campaign here. Here I have a campaign I'm sending uh, that is uh, impersonating Dropbox, and I'm saying, hey, there's a new iOS iOS device that just signed in. Uh, it's from China. Was that you? And obviously, I'm trying to entice a user to go. Uh, no, that was not me. I need to click this no button as fast as humanly possible. Um, and so I can, I can target this to a single user, I can target this to a group of users. 
In this case, I might just pick one, and I can track the progress of that campaign, when it was created, if the email has been opened, if the link has been clicked, what the user has done in response to that. And so from a user's perspective, they are looking at their email, they get this to come in, they uh, have this fairly convincing looking email that uh, says it's from Dropbox Security, uh, it's got the Dropbox logo, it's actually using the same style that Dropbox itself uses. And if they go ahead and click on that link, they're gonna get transported to a page that looks very convincingly like Dropbox. Has anyone seen this page before? Look familiar, right? Ooh, yikes. So, Let's talk afterwards if it does. Yeah, um, what about this page? Has anyone seen that one before? Ooh, let's quick, talk afterwards. Quick pop quiz, which is the real page? Come on security uh -oh. people, you're asking your users to do this in five seconds via email. Let's go, one, two, three, four. All right, you gotta make a decision. Somebody is signing into your Dropbox account right now from China and you need to get your password in here as quickly as possible. Well, we have the legit page and we have the fake page. And obviously you can make these look as realistic as you want. This took just a matter of minutes. But if you look closely on this fake page, it says to unlock your account, you need to log in and download our secure desktop scanning software. So we're just gonna make sure your machine's okay before we uh, reopen access to your Dropbox account. But first, obviously I need your credentials to do that. I don't actually need the credentials, I just want them to download my scanner. But by presenting myself as Dropbox, by asking for credentials, number one, it's an easier win. And number two, maybe I'm even convincing the user that this is a little bit more legit by looking at like the page that they're used to. So, um, how many folks have used a Meterpreter shell before? Metasploit Meterpreter, that, oh, it's, wow. it's very simple. So you know how easy this is to create, in this case, for instance, an EXE file, I'm calling it Dropbox Security Scanner, and it's a very simple payload to call me back on an IP address. Obviously, this is by way of example, there are many tools to do this, but now I have an encrypted connection to a user, uh, to a user's workstation, and I have my initial foothold into that network, right? For, for anyone who's taking notes here, by the way, we do own packets.dev, but this has been taken down, so sorry, there's no <laughs> fishing link up there in case you wanted some creds. <laughs> For sure. Okay. All right, so at this point, Aaron thinks he's all sneaky. He's I got his well. initial access in. Right. He's got a shell talking back. Um, now, from an email perspective, this really is a tougher area, I'll admit, a tougher area sometimes for network introspection. I'm going to remove email examination clients outside of this because we're gonna pull that into content examination, but my email could be in a third party. My email could be in some sort of an encrypted traffic. It just depends on how our setup is, if we're using O365 versus on-prem exchange, so on and so forth. So at this point, he still may have a little bit of an advantage from the initial access, but it's that initial user call out that I can start to pivot for. So I can look for suspicious HTTP, I can look for, let's see, suspicious DNS request, mm -hmm. because he may not always use a legitimate domain. I could look for things not Dropbox, but Dropbox.com, so on and so forth. I could also pivot through some of his user agents, because unfortunately, once again, he's in the world of, I'm gonna send you an email, I'm gonna craft something in HTTP, that HTTP usually has some sort of a structure to it. The absence of a structure is something I can look for. Structure is gonna become very crucial for us defenders as we walk through some of these examples here. But I'll give Aaron a little bit of advantage here and I'll say, you know what, you came in with a phishing email, I'm gonna ask my users to be a little bit better, but depending on where our email is, I may not have every opportunity to detect him here and there. Again, we're removing host-based examination, we're removing email content examination from this. I wanna catch him a different way at that packet level. So we'll let him continue on thinking he's won this round. All right. Well, and obviously I have. So I, I have my initial access, right? And so now uh, I want to go ahead and acquire some credentials. As Matt said, there are a number of protocols that uh, I am taking advantage of that might be leaving some traces behind. But if I have the cred credentials of a legitimate user, now things can get much more difficult for them. So let's talk about how I could do that. How many folks have used Mimikatz before? Yeah, all right. So for those of you who aren't aware, Mimikatz is a tool that lets me dump credentials from local workstations, from various uh, uh, credential caches on a, on a local machine or potentially even over a network. Um, but there's, a, there's a, actually a really cool tool. So there's obviously several methods, but there's one that I'd really like to focus on for just a moment, and it's called DC Sync. Um, and so DC Sync uh, is a, uh, a module built into Mimikatz that allows me to effectively impersonate a domain controller. So to, there, you can have multiple domain controllers, they talk using this thing called the Directory Replication Service, DRS, and uh, Mimikatz has the ability to act as though it were a domain controller, and with uh, administrative credentials lets me download everything uh, in that credential store. And so that includes things like the uh, security ID of the users, things like password hashes, including previous password hashes, 
fundamentally, I get to pretend I'm a domain controller and say, yeah, I need these things to do my job. Please give them to me now. Now, as a defender, I'm going to point out two things. Aaron's not done walking through this part yet, but as a defender, I want to point out two things that he said. Number one, some of you may have also heard of this attack referred to as DC promo. That's another term that it goes by. So if you're like, I haven't heard of DC sync, you may have. It's just something else. But there's another point I want to point out. If you notice, Aaron said there's a preferred way I have of doing things. Defenders, when you hear or see the word preferred, that starts to border into threat intel and behavior development. So now, based on the way he's doing things, I can start to say, hmm, I noticed this is his preferred technique of doing things. So let's let him walk through it and then see if there's a way I can cut that preference off before it goes too far. Sure, sure. Uh, so I've got my interpreter session here. I can look at uh, get UID. I'm in uh, Matt's domain, which he's named Gotham, and obviously he is Batman. Uh, and so oh, I can yeah, that's right. <laughs> I can use this DC sync uh, tool to dump uh, all the information associated uh, with that account from the his his domain controller. And so this includes, uh, as I said, usernames, uh, security IDs, password, uh, uh, including previous passwords, all those hashes uh, that give me uh, access when I, I can either crack them or pass them uh, to move further into his network. And just to be clear, this particular part of the attack here, um, this is essentially the same procedure as elevate a system to a domain controller. However, we didn't actually elevate a system to domain controller. What we did is we sent out the right signals that said, hey, we're going to be elevating. Hey, we'd like domain replication. And that makes the domain controller immediately speak up and say, hey, buddy, cool. Here, buddy, here's everything you need yeah. to make it work. So to be clear, this is from a, a regular Windows 10 workstation. This isn't from some sensitive uh, server inside the network. Um, OK. So I, I, let's talk about a little bit about what this looks like on the wire. Yeah, so on the network, Aaron now thinks he's all crafty because he's got his nice little shell built in, and he's all inside of encrypted tunnels and so on and so forth. You look at and these things. Like, what, are, what does this even mean? Yeah, but there's a problem here. Notice what I just said. I just said out loud that this particular technique makes a system look like a domain controller yelling outbound. If any of you in this room right now stood up, ripped your shirt off, and started screaming out some unintelligible language, guess what? That's an alert for the rest of us because that's not, I hope, normal behavior. I hope. Now, if there's someone over here who's like, yeah, he does that all the time, then, okay, we'll We're let that go. We're not from around here. So We're not from know, around here. I don't know, but unfortunately, what Aaron may not have realized is at the packet level, he threw out a very, very specific request. And if we take this protocol and we actually put this in the DR directory remain replication services API call, I can actually see what's known as a DC get and see changes. And this particular call says, I am a domain controller and I would like to initiate some sort of synchronization. The problem here is that this particular API call, that one packet should never originate outside of anything I expect. It should never originate from a host name. It should never originate from a non-server cluster. And I'd say it should never originate from a non-privileged, this system is a domain controller. So he just gave me an awesome alert because now I can throw that API call against all my underprivileged subnets or my least privileged users. And I can use that to my advantage as well. Now, did you want to talk about what Mimikatz is the next step here? Sure. Well, sure. Um, so it's, well, actually, you know what? I'll keep going. Yeah, I'll keep going. Because yeah. we'll say, again, he thinks he's crafty, and now he's starting to shake a little bit because now I'm detecting this activity here. So in any event, the problem here is that when he ran that particular module, he did get access to all of the accounts on the domain controller. He got access to everything that comes back. And that's with that slash all option. And what that does is it brings back that ntds.dit. Well, what if you're stuck in the position of, wait, I see that API call that I wouldn't expect to see. What happened after that API call? The question I'm really asking here is, Aaron ran DC sync. Was it successful? Cool. I'll use what I know then about packet size to come back and I'll say, hey, everyone, there's your API call, followed by a whole bunch of packets with, I'll take a look, 1418 bytes as part of them. So essentially, let's look at this from a network perspective without any context whatsoever. An API call originated from a system that should not have had it followed by a successive amount of data transfer from that system in response to that API call. That's what that call looks like on the network level. That's what an attacker who kicks off DC sync. So his preferred method, easily detectable because he came in from a user workstation. Now, if he had spearfished a server, which we're never reading email from, right? If he spearfished a server, maybe he would have subverted that subnet rule. But I caught him in this particular case here because there we go. I should never see this call being made from that particular system. So here's a nice little summary that sums up those API calls, where I would and where I would not expect to see them. So defensively, we can use this to our advantage. And now I can start to build in Active Directory aware rules. Now, I will offer one defensive caveat here. First off, we are inside the network. I did, if you all noticed, let the spearfish happen. I let that take place. 
argumentatively, we could say we're collecting intelligence. I'm learning how Aaron does what he does. Sure, yeah. I'm learning You're his techniques. You're letting me win. No, I'm letting fine. him win, right? You all are familiar with stages of containment and active defense where we let the attacker believe they're winning, and then we close that tunnel, 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 tunnel until finally smack them out, and they're done like the pesky flies they are. But nonetheless, we let him go, but we started to build some intel. Now I have a better development. But now I'm going to upset the initial part of his game. And I'm going to go back to the beginning. And I'm going to say, I let you get so far. So at this point now, I've shut down DC Sync. He's still got that shell beaconing out. And he's stuck at the point of, oh, no, my preferred method. And it now was there's, HTTPS. And it was HTTPS, so, so it's, it's encrypted. encrypted. So what are you going to do? Yeah, of course, it's encrypted. There's nothing I can do. HTTPS is encryption. We can't do anything with encryption, right? Talk's over. Talk's over. That's it. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Yeah, right. Come on. Are you kidding me? Encryption? What a joke. Unbelievable. By the way, I'm not going to say again the words man in the middle. I am not going to look at his particular traffic. You know why? I don't need to. I don't need to. We're going to talk about looking for that. Anyone recognize this traffic up here? Of course we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is his shell over port 8443. There's my first indicator, port 8443. If I'm pushing everything over a proxy or if I'm limiting everything to specific ports, here we go. I'll have that port to pivot off of. Okay, if it was 443, though. Okay, if it was, luck. yeah, all right, all right. He'll blend into the noise. All right, yeah, most red teamers take this stance of like, if I blend in, you can't find me. That's cool. Fair enough. I will say that at the very onset, encrypted traffic may present a particular problem, but then we talk about learning how to fingerprint encrypted traffic. And there's a couple different things we can pivot off of to fingerprint them. Uh, there was a fantastic talk yesterday that talked about the FAT tool, fingerprint all the things that also mentioned JA3. So if this looks familiar to you, you may have seen this yesterday in Adele's great talk. But we can pivot our SSL and TLS connections. We can pivot SSH activity, sorry, not pivot, but fingerprint. We can also fingerprint using the certificates because here's what Aaron admitted to. I made my shell with Meterpreter. The way that Meterpreter talks is very, very different from the way Google.com talks. It's very, very different from the way Windows talks. We're gonna talk about what that looks like here. So the first one is our JA3 hash. If you haven't heard about this before, this came over from a team that I think used to be all Salesforce, but I think one of these gentlemen has left Salesforce now. And what they did is they wanted to start to profile the client hello. And the client hello, for all intents and purposes, is the way that a client says, hello, I would like to start a TLS connection, please. Let's start talking encrypted. Believe it or not, clients have very different ways of talking to each other. When I say clients, by the way, everyone, I don't mean like Windows versus Linux. I mean Python URL lib version one versus curl version two. Those things have very definitive ways of saying hello. Which, by the way, my interpreter session says hello. Says hello. Totally the same way. Allegedly, that's what he says. Oh. Allegedly, it says uh, the same way as what? As those tools, or it says hello the same way every time? Well, we'll find out. We'll find out in just a second here. It says it the same way every time, just in case. There's also the JA3S. The JA3S is how the server responds. So there is a client hello, and then there's a server, hey, what's up? It's actually a server hello, but it's a server, hey, what's up? <laughs> hey, you, you gave me a, a selected list of protocols. Here's the protocols that I would like to establish this session in. Now, from my perspective, I'm the server, he's the client. J3S may not give me much in this case, but let's flip that situation. Let's say I see who he's beaconing out to, and he's beaconing out over HTTPS to a C2 somewhere, a domain, a system out there that established connectivity. I now have a way to profile the way his server says hello back to his client. So I can take that analysis and use it to pivot through nasty, dirty, malicious clients talking to potentially suspicious hosts. I now have two fingerprints. We didn't look at any encrypted traffic. We didn't man in the middle anything. We literally took the first two packets on the client and server side and said, give me some details inside of these. The other thing that took place after this hello exchange is a certificate. Well, that's our X509 standard. That gives us some information we can pivot off of as well because once again, he is using an automated tool. He is using a tool that tries to abstract away the complications of forging your own TLS connection for an attacker. Therefore, some things have to be standardized, hard-coded in, or randomized within very, very easily predictable values. Because that's not the fun part. Well, I mean, I, could you imagine if creating a reverse shell involved registering a domain, picking your own username and organizational unit? And writing my own TLS and stack. And writing your own TLS stack? Yeah. That would just be absolutely boring. Although, oddly enough, we've examined enough exploits in the past four <laughs> days that a lot of people try to write their own TLS stack. But we'll come to that in just a second. We'll get there. A few X509 details I can get. And if anyone here has done certificate analysis before, you know that there are very, very crucial fields I can pivot off of here because these fields are all arbitrary. They can be forged. They can be empty. But think again, I'm looking for suspicious or potentially malicious traffic inside of legitimate. Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Apple, so on and so forth, your big name hitters have no need to forge any information inside of here. At least 
So we thought, and then we realized that companies are manning the military. That's sorry, another another day, another okay. day. We'll Dip come back to that. Talk, yeah. But I can take that X509 cert and I can pivot through some of the details. Now we spent a lot of time talking about a lot of different artifacts. And I can go through and pivot through our J3, our J3Ss. I can pivot through X509s. There's a bunch of information up here. Hopefully, as I'm bringing all these up, by the way, you all are looking at this and you're like, wait, these domains make no sense whatsoever. Too I human. know, because his tool is randomizing all of these values. So therefore, I can come back and I can do analysis. And all I need to do analysis are two different things. The top part of this screenshot is actually the certificate that was exchanged back and forth during that initial TLS setup. The bottom part is output from Bro, or now known as Zeek, which goes through and automatically calculates the J3 for us. So on the screen right here, I've got the X509 details that detail Aaron's connection reaching out, and I've got a J3 hash. Now you can take that 72A589, that is a meterpreter J3 hash reaching out, wait, it gets better, over, uh, sorry, connecting from Windows 10. So I can even get operating system specific in what this means. For the record, I didn't believe him, and he was a jerk, and he just sent me the screenshot. I had to manually type in that whole stupid hash into Google, <laughs> and sure enough, there's posts that are like, yep, that's totally Meterpreter, yep, that's totally I, Windows 10. I, I went underground for the brief second he asked me for the hash, <sighs> so a screenshot was it. That's yeah. all we had available. So there we go. Going. Reverse HTTPS, easy. I'll fingerprint it, I'll find it, it's gonna stand out. Even if, I can't tell you definitively that each one of those hashes is bad. I can tell you that right after a fish, this JA3 showed up. That's a nice little temporal correlation I have. Didn't look at a single encrypted packet, just started out at the very beginning. Okay. All right, you happy now? Well, all right, everything you just talked about was focused on TLS, on HTTPS, on certificates. What if I take that away from you? Red Teamers always have an excuse. Absolutely, right, yeah, well, just, let's make it, more, make it harder. Okay, uh, by the way, this what are you is, gonna do? This is blood pressure, so this picture, by the way, is meant to raise your blood pressure. That's my house, <laughs> in case anyone's curious. That's what, my, that's what my server closet looks like. All right, so this is, this is trivial for me, right, because I'm using a simple framework that lets me, with a single keystroke, change this from a reverse HTTPS to reverse HTTP. Cool, all right. Well, wait, so why would you drop encryption? Well, all the things you were just fingerprinting me on are now gone, okay. and now I just blend in with HTTP traffic. All that work you had to put into it, deploying all these tools, one all keystroke, right. and I'm all done. All right, we'll give him a plus. Who here is not capturing 80? I like how no one wants to raise their hand. That's fantastic. Well done. You did not fall into that trap. Fantastic. Well done. Okay, fine. So you want to blend in with the noise. That's all right, because now I have what you just took away from me. Oh, I don't want you to be able to fingerprint my intrinsic traffic. That's cool. I'll fingerprint the plain text traffic. This is what Meterpreter looks like calling out. Now, if any of you work for uh, CDN networks or anything like that, you're probably used to really strong dynamic strings being sent out and whatnot, but ones that equal the download of an MZ header is one that I'm obviously gonna pivot off of and be very, very concerned about. That just does not look right to me whatsoever. Another point inside of there, which we'll look at, take right here, this is the binary. This is the HTTP shell that Aaron brought down into that particular system. Does anyone recognize anything inside of there? Hopefully you do, because it's all bytes, and we all know we can read bytes without needing any sort of translation. But in case you are a little groggy after last night's fireworks on a jet ski show, take a look at the very bottom. There's a user agent. So once again, even by subverting HTTPS and giving me a very, very noisy protocol, you've still given me hard-coded credentials. Or not credentials, hard-coded user agents. Hard-coded strings, hard -code yeah. strings mm -hmm. things that I can look for. So you're not gonna get to credentials because I'm gonna catch it earlier on than that. Now, could you change that value? Sure, yeah. Sure, you could. You could change that value easily and that's okay because I'm still gonna have an MZ header that has your callback baked inside of it. That's gonna be in plain text as well. An MZ that gets downloaded on the network via a super long HTTP request with built-in user agent strings and built-in callbacks, I'm gonna detect that pretty easily. So sorry, your HTTPs are only gonna take you so far. All right, all right. And here's an example of his beaconing activity. I'm just gonna leave that as, duh, this is obviously bad. And we all know why. All right, fair enough, fair enough. All right, so. What? Yeah, they, sorry, it's your house again. Uh, so even more difficult now. Again, uh, I had HTTP. Okay, fine. I'll make it a proprietary protocol. I'll come up with my own thing. So uh, you don't have any tools, and I can add my own. I can add my own encryption. I can add my own encoding. How are you gonna figure it out? Finally, the red teamer does some work. Yeah. Finally, there we go. There's the reverse TCP. Yeah. I got no headers, it's gone. Strings this. No encrypted, no strings. Can anyone see any strings? Can anyone read this stuff? You can now. Guess what? Even reverse TCP comes with a signature built into it. The way that Meterpreter forms packets is once again predictable. 
And once we start to analyze the way that they use the protocol, I can all of a sudden say, wait a second, there's a signature in here. Yes, you are using raw TCP over port 80, fantastic. Guess what? You're leaving another trace. That by itself would be something maybe potentially suspicious. Depends on what's in the environment. You never know. But you're leaving a signature for me. You're leaving a structure that I can go and parse and I can go and analyze. And this right here, everyone, actually is the structure of a meterpreter reverse TCP packet as it gets sent out. It starts out with an XOR key, followed by a session GUID that is unique to that particular session, obviously. Then there's even flags that says whether or not this is encrypted. This is how the server and the client continue to communicate with each other. I can even take that structure further down the line, look at a PCAP and say, there's a repeated structure inside of here, I can parse it out. Haven't examined the encrypted traffic just yet. There are ways we could talk about doing that later on, but it would involve us getting on the host and that's, come on, that's cheating, let's not get there. So at the network level, I can simply say, you have a structure here. Now I can't read the content. So if you go and kick off DC sync, I'm gonna be stuck with, I don't know what he did, but I am gonna know where you're coming from. I'm gonna know it's suspicious and I'm likely gonna have an idea of lots of bytes versus little bytes. Beacons versus exfil. Interaction, server to client, versus response, client to server. So I can start to pivot through some of my normal network heuristics to figure out what's happening by identifying things with this particular structure. So there you go. So I'm not gonna lie, this is getting a little bit frustrating. Well, that's the point. And I may actually have to put down my beer. Okay. And go, oh day. Oh. All right. So I'm gonna come at you with some protocol, some vuln you, don't, you aren't prepared for. Okay. Yeah, because this one's tough. All right. Hopefully everyone recognizes what this is. If not, if not, we'll educate you really, really quickly here. Quick summary. Quick summary. Blue Keep was a vulnerability that came out within the past, what, two weeks now? I think. That. Yeah. Past two weeks, vulnerability came out. It was named Blue Keep by someone who was watching Game of Thrones. For anyone who's wondering, yes, it is a pivot off of Red Keep, which is perfect for this talk, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and in any event, it was a vulnerability that came out for all intents and purposes, allows for unauthenticated remote code execution via RDP. To system, by the way. To system. You will run so, it with system privileges. Let's just say, for, me. for anyone looking for severity, if you have not heard about this yet, if you're looking for how severe is this, Microsoft patched XP. Hopefully that means enough where you're like, oh, I should pay attention to this. Because this unsupported operating system that like one org in the world pays for support for, everyone got it for free at this point. And I'll do you one better. RDP supports encryption. It Multiple does. Multiple types of encryption. It does. So, so now we're taking a lot of lessons and stacking them on top of each other. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, this is not undetectable, despite being a zero day. We're gonna talk about how and why that is. Now, we do not have a working exploit. We're not gonna demo a working exploit. So if anyone's like, can I have a copy of your exploit? The answer is no, um, because that's not our game here. We're not here to give away exploits, but let's just say that it's only a matter of time before hopefully this thing never reaches infamy, never. Let's see if we can stop it a little bit earlier on. So all right. Couple things to know, RDP is an extremely complex protocol. Before we had it easy, we were only talking about TLS, HTTP, raw TCP, so on and so forth. Those are easy packets, very, very predictable. RDP is this massive complex stack of things that take place and it's always encrypted. Almost, almost always encrypted, almost. When an RDP connection is initiated, the very, very first thing that takes place is a client and a server say hello. Now it's not literally a hello, it's actually called a connection initiation and a connection response. And this is part of an initial X224 packet series that gets sent out. One packet back, sorry, one packet out, one packet back. Did you all hear what I just said? There are a couple details inside of here. One packet out, one packet back. The request includes a cookie and a requested security protocol, AKA, I would like to connect over this. The response includes a success or a failure. This traffic is always unencrypted. I don't care what RDP turns into after this exchange. This exchange is always an unencrypted. So we took a look at that and we said, hold on a second here. We just talked about JA3 a few moments ago. There are now some of the same details that we can work off of and that we can pivot through. I've got an unencrypted space. I've got parameters that should be included inside of a connection request, very similar to a client hello. So we started doing some testing. What did we For find? Sure. Yeah, and so uh, we were actually surprised to see that this, it is possible, and in fact very possible, to identify what is legitimate and illegitimate activity. Uh, and so obviously, as, as Matt said, we don't have a POC, we don't have uh, a, a working version of this, but we can make some pretty good assumptions based off the scanners that are out there, and based off what we were able to learn from uh, RDP, uh, both from legitimate clients and from some of that scanner activity, and just working through all the possibilities. So if we take our standard 
gamut of Windows clients, uh, we can look and see, is there a cookie present? And remember that, that cookie, there's some information that might be able to glean, be gleaned off of that. Yep. Uh, the, but then we can also look at the requested security protocols. And obviously, as versions of Windows have gotten newer, they've added more and more support. And as you progress through those versions of Windows, they will in indicate to the server that they want to go ahead and step up that encryption level. Now, the problem is, from an attacker's perspective, well, first off, dealing with TLS is a pain in the butt. So I'd much rather turn that sort of thing off. That would, make it, that would make it easier to write an attack tool. But even if I do have an attack tool, I can turn on something like the low level, the TLS encryption, like you see down at the bottom, that some tools do. Uh, but there's an issue with this particular vulnerability, which is that as you step up, at, at least from, our, uh, from what we've, uh, you know, been, what's been published so far, uh, that as you step up to higher levels of encryption, it becomes actually a not vulnerable scenario. And so there's an advantage for the attacker, both from ease, but also for necessity, to stay at a lower tier. But before we even get to that stage, we can see from the cookie and from that requested security protocol, whether this is legitimate or not. Is this behaving like a normal version of Windows? And let's make one more mention. Aaron talked about it's easier to go this certain route. So we're gonna hopefully see our attackers choose to go that easier route. One thing I will note about this is you can see the more, the more newer you get in operating systems, the more advanced it tends to get. There has been, and again, we have not been able to prove this because we don't have that working POC, but for everyone who has one, there, the rumor out there is that NLA does mitigate this, network level authentication. So obviously that would stand to reason then the more I increase in security and authentication, the earlier on in the process that takes place, therefore, higher security, vulnerability is mitigated. That's a nice funnel for us defenders because it funnels my attackers into potentially unencrypted or lightly encrypted space, which we can use to our advantage. For sure. Now, we've got a few screenshots that we'll take a look through here for various operating systems. Um, each screenshot is going to take a look a little bit like this look right here. We're not asking you to obviously memorize these structures or anything. This is just to give you some insight in what this initial packet looks like. Windows XP, for example, will come over with a cookie, but it will not come over with an encryption request, a default of zero. That, that resorts to RDP security, which allows for fantastic visibility. Windows 7 will not give a cookie, but it will come across with a security request of CRED SSP, which by default also includes TLS. Windows 10 in 2016 will come with a cookie, but they also roll in with a security protocol request of B, and B is CRED SSP all the way up. CRED SSP with early user authorization, CRED SSP uh, as well as TLS. Our desktop, we're breaking outside of Windows now. This comes across with a cookie and a protocol request, but let's take a look at some of the more important tools, because notice how now all of a sudden when we get into Metasploit, RDP scan, oops, sorry, Metasploit and RDP scan, take a look at that security protocol request. They come to the door requesting TLS and only TLS. That is an absolute anomaly compared to the rest of your operating systems. For sure. So we had a few observations yeah, out and, of this as well. And so from this, we mentioned cookie names. You'll notice through those uh, through the, the screenshots that we had there that you can get some username information off of there. And potentially, if you know what's a legitimate username, you can key off of that and say this is a, this is a user that's actually on my domain. Alternatively, if you see a randomized string, obviously it's not very easy to key off of that. But there's there's some useful information there. Uh, seeing a very low request or uh, the absence specifically of a request is indicative of Windows XP. But keep in mind that when you you do that, you are you are accepting no encryption. So I can uh, so really uh, from the attack perspective, the best I can do is behave like a Windows XP client would, but in doing so, I'm allowing Matt to see everything that's inside of that traffic. So even doing so is anomalous. So if he steps down, I'm still going to see what's taking place in that case right there. Right. Um, there was one other scenario, or two other scenarios where we saw a double tack take place, and we've got just a couple more summary points here, and then we're all set. Um, when a downgrade takes place, meaning if I'm an attacker and I try to force from high to low, you will see a double tap where the connection gets forcibly reset. That gives us another anomalous alert. And as we mentioned as well, there is a POC that does that, and it gives you a double tap, but once again, it comes through with a TLS request. So either way, our TLS or absence of encryption would still catch either of those taking place there. Yeah. And here's an example of that particular screenshot and that double tap. Now, seeing as we are almost just about out of time, and we want to give everyone an opportunity to kind of catch the next session and whatnot, I think we'll hop to our conclusion slide For sure. and just say that from a host-based perspective, there are a lot of artifacts you could dig into, but the host is not the only place where I can catch what Aaron is doing and what the red teamers are doing. I can usually catch them earlier at the network level because there's sometimes very definitive signals that say they're doing what they're doing at that case. For sure, and, and I've been very impressed throughout this process to see that even when you rely on things like encryption as an attacker trying to hide in with what is considered best practices and normal HTTP and, and, uh, HTTPS and TLS, that you still leave a lot of those fingerprints behind. And so there's a lot of value to be gleaned from that, that sort of information. 
And lastly, we'll just say that uh, you know any deviation from standard protocol is yet another anomaly itself. As you notice, as we walk through these things, I was looking for areas where Aaron's tools broke out of what I expected to see. Or when I had to break or away. Or when he had to, because sure. we were catching him too much. Absolutely. But with that, everyone, I think we are just at time. Am I right? We're just at time. So thank you all very much for coming this afternoon, or this morning. I think it is still. Still this morning? <laughs> still this morning. Thank you all for coming this morning. It was awesome having you in here. We'd love to entertain questions outside if we need to move off the stage. But otherwise, thank you all very much. Have an awesome day, too, of Auser. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. Thank you very much, guys.